afternoon. The topic this afternoon is why gold is money. And I toyed with the idea of exploring this important subject in many different ways. And it's actually something I talk considerably about right around the world. And it so happens that in September I was in Hong Kong and the CFA Institute um, asked me if I wanted to have my presentation, which is entitled Monetary Disorder and the Role of Gold, recorded uh, to be put on their website as a webcast. I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So we did that at the end of September and yesterday they sent a first draft edited version edited not in the sense they, they changed what I said, but they modified the uh, layout of my slides because my slides had some pictures that perhaps weren't appropriate <coughs> for them. And I was hoping to play, if not all of that, some of it, but at the moment I can't get access to the internet. But I wasn't going to do that to begin with. Um, because the authority on why gold is money is Cal Menga, without question. And this little book, an essay, that I think it's the Mises Institute, yes it is, the Mises Institute that has published this short essay of Cal Menga, written in 1892, obviously originally in Germany, uh, so it's very easy to read, very short, and I will be reading passages of it. And I would like to attempt a uh, Socratic type of discussion. So, in other words, engage in discussion as we go along with what I read. How many of you have actually read Karl Menger's essay on the origins of money? I would have been very surprised if you hadn't raised your hand, Sandeep, or Philip, but I'm sure the professor has as well, although he didn't bother to raise his hand. <laughs> He's read everything <laughs> Cal Menger's written. Um, so, and, and then I will, I will begin with um, reading, in fact, uh, passages of the introduction in that book that was written by the, uh, is he president? Uh, <coughs> Douglas French at the Mises Institute, president or some position. And I'll start with that because it is what I live uh, every day, especially as I speak in public about this. He writes, uh, this is the introduction, not Cal Menger, this is uh, the introduction to the book. The public's understanding of what money is and its origins has devolved to the point where the government monetary authorities can now inflate with impunity with the ultimate result to be the destruction of the divis division of labor undoing all of mankind's progress to date. <laughs> That's the first sentence. That's pretty, I'll, uh, pretty, pretty massive statement there. Um, <clears throat> the average Joe and Jane must trust the wise men and women working secretly in central banks around the world with what passes for money, paper and digits on a computer screen. These banks are the largest employers of academically trained economists, but under the guidance of the Keynesian school, the central banks engage in monetary operations that fulfill the funding needs demanded by politicians for political ends. Well, I would add to that that it's not just the average Joe and Jane, and it's not just the general public, it's actually the investment professionals as well um, in the industry that don't understand what money is. Um, reading a little bit more out of the introduction um, written by Douglas French. 
The hopes, dreams, and living standards of millions are affected daily by these faceless bureaucrats that supposedly know exactly which monetary buttons to push and levers to pull to ensure our prosperity. However, history shows that central bankers have but one strategy. Does anyone care to mention what it is? <laughs> to cure all things, especially their past mistakes. Print more money. <clears throat> and he concludes, it was Menga who developed a complete theory of social institutions as we discussed this morning in the presentation about how important those social interactions are. And I liked Sandeep, your alternative um, expression to economic activity as being social interactions. Um, <clears throat> It was Menger who developed a complete theory of social institutions which arise as humans interact, each with his own subjective knowledge and experiences. It is the spontaneous evolution of these human actions that create institutions whereby individuals discover certain patterns <coughs> of behavior that aid each person in attaining their goals more efficiently. Nothing is more central to this evolution than the development of money. Making the division of labor possible and satisfaction of wants attainable. Menger is extraordinary in his work, in my view, especially because his whole focus is about individual action. Whereas today, economics and money is thought of in aggregate terms as opposed to really what happens at the individual level as if it does not matter because there is a central institution that overrides and governs all that. Any comments on that introduction before I begin reading passages on the essay that Menger wrote um, over a hundred years ago. When was this written? This forward? November 2009. Good question. You just checked. Where did I put it? Yeah, November 2009. I, I just think it cannot be, I agree 100%. I don't think it can be overemphasized that nothing less than the division of labor is at stake uh, you know, when it comes to this. And if you read the people that, there's a lot of people that sort of get a sense that some sort of collapse is coming. You read what they're talking about is how to have a subsistence garden in your own backyard. And they don't necessarily seem to be aware of what that means for the quality of life and the standard of living that everybody has to duplicate the effort of everyone else without any economies of scale, without any specialization. Okay, so no other questions or comments to make. So let me get into the, uh, the essay. Um, and again, I won't read all of it. I mean, I'll just read some passages that I find um, are so clearly, well, clearly, bear with me, the language is a little bit old and sometimes the sentences are a bit long. But you can tell the man has devoted a lot of thought to trying to understand the origins of money. How this concept of having an intermediate medium of exchange to reach our ends is not happened out of, you know, um, in a mysterious way. The idea which lay first to hand for an explanation of the specific function of money as a universal current medium of exchange was to refer it to a general convention or legal dispensation. The problem which science has here to solve consists in giving an explanation of a general homogeneous course of action pursued by human beings when engaged in traffic, economic activity, 
which taken concretely makes unquestionably for the common interest, and yet which seems to conflict with the nearest and immediate interest of contracting individuals. Under such circumstances, what could lie more contiguous than the notion of referring the foregoing procedure to causes lying outside the sphere of individual considerations? To assume that certain commodities, precious metals in particular, had been exalted into the medium of exchange by general convention or law in the interest of commonwealth solved the difficulty and solved it apparently the more easily and naturally inasmuch as the shape of the coin seemed to be a token of state regulation. Such in fact is the opinion of Plato, Aristotle, who was largely mentioned this morning, and the Roman jurists, closely followed by the medieval writers. Even the more modern developments in the theory of money have not in substance got beyond this standpoint an assumption. We all have to be careful what we assume. It, was that too um, difficult to follow in terms of the language? Basically what he's saying is that it's been assumed largely that money was a construct of legislation or, or people in power. Tested more closely the assumption underlying this theory gave room to grave doubts. An event of such high and universal significance and of notoriety so inevitable, the assumed way money was created, as the establishment by law or convention of a universal medium of exchange would certainly have been retained in the memory of man the more certainly inasmuch as it would have had to be performed in a great number of places. Yet no historical monument gives us trustworthy tidings of any transactions either conferring distinct recognition on media of exchange already in use or referring to their adoption by peoples of comparatively recent culture, much less testifying to an initiation of the earliest stages of economic civilization in the use of money. He's saying that if this assumption was well-founded, surely there would be some evidence somewhere in the world, in the historical record, or in a manifestation in terms of a monument to mark this discovery, or this, if not discovery, this happening. Does everybody follow that? So this is, still, we're talking about the origins of money, and eventually how gold became money. Um, we'll, we'll, this is where we're getting. The next section deals with the problem of the genesis, genesis of a medium of exchange. Here's a passage. <coughs> he talks about the difficulty of people in a primitive economy satisfying their needs before the invention of money, before money was actually something that existed, before people thought of a medium of exchange. These difficulties of reaching your end need would have proved absolutely insurmountable obst obstacles to the progress of traffic or social interaction, and at the same time to the production of goods not commanding a regular sale, had there not laid a remedy in the very nature of things, to wit the different degrees of saleableness of commodities. And this is so important. I can't write on a blackboard here, but it's the different degrees of saleableness of commodities, he argues, is the very nature of things that led to the discovery in due course of what commodity would be best used as money. So bear 
with me. He's continuing in his essay, and they haven't discovered money yet. He's trying to explore how money was discovered. So, or, or imagine yourself in a uh, more primitive economy where there isn't such a thing that everybody recognizes as money. The concept doesn't exist yet. And the next section deals with commodities as more or less saleable. He argues that it is an error in economics as prevalent as it is patent that all commodities at a definite point in time and in a given market may be assumed to stand to each other in a definite relation of exchange. In other words, may be mutually exchanged in definite quantities at will. This is the basis of his whole argument that he takes, that the professor talked about this morning, that there is no monolithic price. There is a price, a selling price and a buying price. And they're, they're, they're two different, different things. And the price at which anyone can at pleasure buy a commodity at a given market in a given point in time and the price at which he can dispose of the same at pleasure are two essentially different magnitudes. Why is that? Anyone? He argues that at any rate there is no such thing as a general saleableness of wares in this sense. The truth is that even in the best organized markets, while we may be able to purchase when and what we like at a definite price, the purchasing price, we can only dispose of it again when and as we like at whatever that selling price will be. Any comments so far? We're getting to gold eventually. Yeah. Then his next, sec next section I'm going to read the passage of is on the genesis of media of exchange. We, we haven't reached that point yet, but he makes the point that not all commodities are readily saleable or exchangeable, um, and some are more saleable than others. It has long been the subject of universal remark in centers of exchange that for certain commodities there existed a greater, more constant, and more effective demand than for other commodities, less desirable in certain respects, the former being such as correspond to a want on the part of those able and willing to traffic, which is at once universal and by reason of the relative scarcity of the goods in question, always imperfectly satisfied. And further, that the person who wishes to acquire certain definite goods in exchange for his own is in a more favorable position if he brings commodities of this kind to market than if he visits the market with goods which cannot display such advantages, or at least not in the same degree. Thus equipped, he has the prospect of acquiring such goods as he finally wishes to obtain, not only with greater case, greater ease, sorry, and security, but also by reason of the steadier and more prevailing demand for his own commodities at prices corresponding to the general economic situation or economic prices. So that by this devious way of immediate exchange, accepting something intermediate to the end need, he gains the prospect of accomplishing his purpose more surely and economically than if he had confined himself to direct exchange. And so it has come to pass that as man became increasingly conversant with these economic advantages, 
mainly by an insight become traditional and by the habit of economic action, that those commodities which relatively to both space and time are most saleable have in every market become the wares which it is not only in the interest of everyone to accept in exchange for his own less saleable goods, but which also are those he actually does readily accept. And their superior saleableness depends only upon the relatively inferior saleableness of every other kind of commodity, by which alone they have been able to become generally acceptable media of exchange. Fairly long sentences, but to say that it's really habit habit of economic action and observing that certain commodities had more had the, a nature of being more saleable, readily accepted by everyone at all times and in all places, that people through habit of economic uh, exchange uh, discovered that gradually things worked better as that media intermediate medium of exchange. So habit or human action was a very important factor in the genesis of uh, this concept of having a medium of exchange. And eventually goods which had thus become generally, we're not talking about money yet, it's just, again, progress was that certain goods were recognized more than others to work well as this intermediate medium of exchange. Goods, which had thus become generally acceptable media of exchange, were called by the Germans Geld, from Gelten. In other words, to pay, to perform, while other nations derive their designation for money mainly from the substance used, such as the um, French did, or the shape of the coin, uh, and so forth. So, it is not impossible for media of exchange, serving as they do to the Commonwealth in the most emphatic sense of the word, to be instituted also by way of legislation like other social institutions, but this is neither the only nor the primary mode in which money has taken its origin. I spoke. It's, this is much more to be traced in the process depicted above, notwithstanding the nature of that process would be, notwithstanding the nature <coughs> of that process would be but very incompletely explained if we were to call it organic or denote money as something primordial or primeval growth, or so forth. So, putting aside the assumptions mentioned earlier, he argues that we can only come fully to understand the origins of money by learning to view the establishment of the social procedure. I can come back again to the social interaction with which we are dealing as the spontaneous outcome, the unpremeditated resultant of particular individual efforts of the members of a society who have little by little worked their way to a discrimination of the different degrees of saleableness and commodities. So money came into being because of a lot of human interaction. And some being better at it than others, and you know, like anything in evolution. Um, we'll see as the rest of the essay progresses, we've managed to probably create the most important institution in human affairs, money. Any comments so far before I carry on? So how did, how did it happen that people differentiated between commodities uh, to be used as media of exchange? Well, 
when the relatively most saleable commodities became money, the great event has in the first place the effect of substantially increasing their originally high saleableness. Every economic subject is not only a few smart people coming to market with that knowledge anymore, but everybody has recognized that if you go to market with this particular commodity, you'll reach your end much faster. <clears throat> to acquire goods of another sort has thenceforth a stronger interest in converting what he has in the first instance into wares which have become money. For such persons, by the exchange of their less saleable wares for those which as money are most saleable, attain not merely <clears throat> as heretofore a higher probability, but then certainty of being able to acquire forthwith equivalent quantities of every kind of commodity to be had in the market. In other words, once it was finally recognized that this particular commodity could be readily exchanged with certainty, then it, it wasn't just a few who benefited. It's a bit like today, we all use dollars, euros, those currencies with certainty because it's recognized by everybody as being good medium of exchange. And that could change if that belief were to disappear. Any comments? So we're getting to gold. So far he explained that there has been a progressive social interaction um, that determined that certain commodities became recognized as the most such, so much more saleable than anything else that they were used as an intermediate medium of exchange. Now, how did the precious metals become money? The commodities which under given local and time relations are most saleable have become money among the same nations at different times and among different nations at the same time, and they are diverse in kind. The reason why precious metals have become the generally current medium of exchange, um, this was in 1892 under a gold standard, is because their saleableness is far and away superior to that of all other commodities. And at the same time, because they are found to be specifically qualified for the concomitant and subsidiary functions of money, such as store of value, such as all the characteristics that uh, Aristotle enumerated. So, again, human interaction continued to evolve to the point of not only recognizing that a certain commodity could be used as money, but that in all cases that commodity became gold because it was the most saleable. And Sandy this morning mentioned the stock to flow ratio. And again, to this day, um, the above ground quantity of the commodity in question is far superior relative to its annual production to any other commodity that could be used for that purpose. So that's why gold is money, or became money. That's what the said you mean. Okay, yeah, thank okay, you. Yeah, that's two, okay, not two. Two. Number two, so why? Three Thank you. Two. Okay. All right. Sorry. Any comments on this? Yeah, I always got to tell you monetary stuff. I'm an engineer. This is called positive feedback. The more one one thing gets a little above the other, it has an edge. So it gets ahead of the other even faster and faster and faster and faster and as it becomes monetized. There's a threshold where nothing comes even close, positive feedback. There's a lot of 
uh, market phenomena that have negative feedback but regulate themselves. But this is run away. Your, your, your guys try different things, they swap this or that, and one starts to have some advantage for some reason, maybe even random reason, maybe because it was considered valuable before. And then it just takes off. And then you can't catch it. And people talk about how long it would take to match the stock that flows in some other commodities. It would take forever, unless you stop mining gold altogether. So you see what I'm saying by positive feedback, as gold gets to be usable as money, it gets such an advantage that nothing else can possibly be even considered money, as long as you can find the money properly. Well, Win or take all would be the phenomenon. Yeah, if you're in Vegas... Uh, no, no, I mean in, in like internet companies or manufacturing companies, whoever gets the edge gets more of an edge because they have an edge and then it, it just run away success. So, so there's one Amazon, there's one eBay, and there'll never be another eBay. Yeah, I mean, and, and bear in mind, this was written in 1892, and we could theoretically have a better substance than gold. I mean, if something could be found <laughs> to be better than gold, but it, it doesn't exist so far. We're not aware of it. Nothing has surpassed gold with all those characteristics. <coughs> gold was found to be the ideal commodity to be used as money through millennia. To uh, speak concretely about this problem, very often it's suggested that platinum might be no. a candidate. But here is the proof, and I'm going back to Sandeep's morning talk when he talked about the uh, stocks to flow ratio. Because of the equality, Manger points out in his essay, The Origin of Money, because of that, it so happened, logically uh, had to happen, that uh, the stocks of gold became so much greater in comparison with the annual flows, so that in order to uh, reproduce the existing gold in quantity, it would take probably 80 years hmm. at the present uh, rate of production. Whereas in the case of copper, it might only take three months. Hmm. Sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, but uh, this the reason is the copper is not going to go into warehouses because once you reach that three months uh, supply, world supply, then the marginal utility of copper cuts in and all the potential users of copper will uh, stay away from the market. This is not the case with gold and platinum, if you ask what is the ratio in, in the case of platinum, it has very little stocks in comparison with the annual flows. And then there's another problem with platinum, which is the, uh, uh, that it's marketed very differently. It's not a free market. It's a, uh, platinum is produced on a contract basis and sold at a lower contracted price than the free market. But I don't want to take time away from you, but this is important, that there's just no way for platinum to challenge gold's leadership. There's nothing emotional about that. The, the, the terrorist uh, Russian government tried, they put the platinum coins oh, that's into right. circulation. They didn't circulate because they were picked up as souvenir. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way you could put them into circulation. Whereas gold and silver had that property. Yes, yes. when you have some recent gold discoveries like they had down in Africa uh, in the 1800s, the, the only thing that managed the stability of the price was the cartel that was put together. 
if it's still managed to have a whole lot of mining companies all marketing their gold separately, you would have had an instability. That was still yeah. not so much yeah. gold. Yeah. Okay. De Beers was, De okay. De Beers was yeah. built around gold. Okay. That's right. Gold free, the gold freely flowed. Much more so than gold. So carrying on with the essay, um, here's another passage. Thus, the effect produced by such goods as are relatively most saleable becoming money is an increasing differentiation between their degree of saleableness and that of other goods. Starting this paragraph again. Thus, the effect produced by such goods as are relatively most saleable becoming money is an increasing differentiation between their degree of saleableness and that of all other goods. And this difference in saleableness ceases to be altogether gradual and must be regarded in a certain aspect of something absolute something absolute. The practice of everyday life as well as jurisprudence which closely adheres for the most part to the notions prevalent in everyday life distinguish two categories in the wherewithal of traffic. Goods, goods which have become money and goods which have not. And the ground of this, the ground of this distinction we find lies essentially in that difference in the saleableness of commodities that mentioned and that I read about. And that difference became so significant for practical life that it was further emphasized by intervention of the state. This distinction, moreover, moreover, finds expression in language in the difference in, of meanings attached. Uh, but I'm going to read this back. Too long a sentence. But Basically, to finish, it argues that it was no accident, or certainly not the consequence of state compulsion, nor voluntary convention of traders that affected the happening of gold being recognized as the perfect medium of exchange, the commodity best used. For it. it was the just apprehending of their individual self-interest which brought it to pass that all the more economically advanced nations accepted the precious metals as money. Money has not been generated by law. In its origin, it is a social and not a state institution. Sanctioned by the authority of the state, is a notion alien to it. On the other hand, however, by state recognition and state regulation, this social institution of money has been perfected. Well, he wrote this in 1892. <laughs> it's been corrupted <laughs> since. Has been perfected and adjusted to the manifold and varying degrees and varying needs of an evolving commerce, just as customary rights have been perfected and adjusted by statute law. But to conclude, all these measures have not first made money of the precious metals, but have only perfected them in their function 
as money. And again, he wrote this when there was still a gold standard in place. So, yes, they were perfected by state institution. Did the concept of precious metals as money was perfected by <coughs> state intervention, but ultimately it was also corrupted. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful essay. You need to read it and realize that what we use without understanding its origin every day, money, um, is an invention of humans through social interaction. It's not, well, there's no need for the state to decide what money is. Humans have already discovered it, and it's gold. So that was uh, Carl Menger's essay as to why gold is money. Now, we've, we've perfected, as he mentions, perfected the medium of exchange to be representations of that over time. But those representations today are not really representations of money anymore. The link with gold has been completely severed. So, any comments or questions? We're going to. Yeah, um, you say the, the link with gold has been completely severed, but has it? Because there's a lot of people that you buy gold because of. The very thing that you have just been discussing. I do. I mean, I think everybody here does. What you do is you convert one form of medium of exchange for one you have more belief in and what you recognize as being money. Because when you buy gold, all you do is buy money. You're going to have to use that money eventually to make a purchase or an investment all it is is money so you you are free to still convert one medium of exchange which is fiat money for another which is not fiat money so so you're right and it and that ability to convert could come to an end it could be outlawed who knows chris i, I didn't hear your um, your, your, your your morning session, so you might have discussed this, but isn't, isn't it a transportation issue as much as, you know, the, the world economy has changed a lot since 1892. Okay, um, I understand exactly what you're talking about, I understand um, what Mingo was saying, um, but we're dealing in a significantly different global economy. I mean, it's a lot harder for us to, you know, sell a whole lot of milk powder and carry wheelbarrows and gold back um, and, and things like that. So what you're really, what you're really talking about is, or, or what I think you, you're, you're suggesting in between the lines is um, move back towards some kind of gold standard whereby paper money is, is, is fixed to some kind of value, correct? Correct. The, the whole point of, of reading this essay is to, because people don't accept that gold is money, first thing. If, but if you do accept gold is money, then you're more inclined to arrest your mind a little longer to the concept of a gold standard or to the concept of um, establishing some kind of discipline on the value of money that's issued on the basis of how much gold is backing it, for example. I think people will certainly, it's distrust in politicians, right? And, and central bankers by virtue of them being politicians as well these days. So well, I mean, I mean, if it's distrust in politicians because they abuse the power right. of uh, issuing money or of uh, not settling their debts. Um, but it's, it's and essentially the problem is that we don't have sound money. If we had sound money, you would not have had an escalation of the unsettled debt that we have and you would not have had um, uh, uh, an abuse in the, the uh, amount of money or the amount of credit uh, issued. Why Nixon? Well, there's many people to blame. It's human action. It's human nature. Yeah. It's human nature. Um, uh, yeah. So, but thanks for, for bringing that point. Yes, the, I'm not suggesting that we necessarily need to go back to a world where 
gold coins or gold as a, a metal form needs to circulate. Yeah, just a second. But um, but I'm I'm constantly frustrated by people not even willing to consider the possibility that gold is money. And that's the very first step of having a good, engaging, and a constructive discussion about monetary reform. It's still linked to the trust in politicians because uh, Benanke explicitly said that gold is not money. Yes, that's right. And, and I, uh, thank you for mentioning that because uh, I have some friends in, in the investment industry that told me that, well, now, Louis, you, sh you should know, I mean, Ben Bernanke told you gold's not money. <laughs> well, for me, that's it's just, it's just part of the deceit. Um, either Ben Bernanke honestly doesn't know that gold is money, which is possible, which is possible. Uh, God help us all. Um, or he, it's... You know, it's, gold has become the enemy since it's been tossed outside of the monetary system. But you were talking about a central banker who has the, the luxurious position of, of being able to print of much, as much of the, reserve, the world's reserve currency at the moment. So it's not only the Benek that we've got to convince, um, it's, it, it, it's a whole bunch of central bankers that continue to provide him with and the US and Barack Obama and all of his um, friends in Washington with cheap capital, right? The world is prepared to continue to flood them. So it's act actually not so much um, being Benanke that we've got to convince. It is, it is Benanke, I know, but I don't remember Benanke. Yeah, you're right. Um, um, it, it, it's not so much him you've got to convince as everyone else that continues to flood him with cheap capital. Because if I was him, I'd sit there and take it as well. And I'd sit there saying exactly the same thing that he, he, he is saying because it maintains exactly what he wants to maintain. Yeah. Reserve currency status. That's right. He has got the most luxurious position in the world. Yeah. And, and, and um, if, um, I, mean, I think the professor has a very good argument and suggestion on, I mean, because going back to a gold standard ain't going to happen mm -hmm. anytime soon from, from the, where we are at. Uh, so a, a better intermediate course of action to... Um, I'd just like to say I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm just giving you my observations. Is, is to say, why not let gold circulate as money in competition with, with, with whatever currencies are issued by the states that are indebted to the hilt? And let's see what happens. I mean, if, if gold isn't money, then it's going to fail on its face, right? But if I can just interject, I think it's not necessarily about having everybody, you know, doing their, their daily, you know, grocery shopping in gold coin, but that they have the right to, that they can. Hmm. And if you, if you establish, if the government establishes a paper standard and says, okay, we're going to fix one unit of our credit paper to be worth whatever amount of gold, that's where the distortions begin. That's where the, uh, the enormous bubble in credit you know, begins. And Gresham's Law says that if you have two things that are forced by law to have the same value, people will hoard the one that's of actual higher value and, and dispense with the other one. So if you have the law says this dollar bill is worth a twentieth of an ounce of gold, long after that's really true in the market, then what happens is all the gold and silver is pulled from circulation and the only thing that circulates ever faster and faster and faster is the paper because it's being overvalued by law. Does that, does that make sense? The gold would disappear from the face of the east, but anybody would have a gold coin. There are people who just hoard it and it goes into hiding. Well, that's what's happening now. Gold is, uh, is disappearing. It's going into hiding. It's not circulating. Yeah. Well, it does circulate, though, because I mean, in a sense that it doesn't circulate as... Apart from Chavez. It, 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 it does circulate. But, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I don't know as much as all you guys. Um, and... But, I mean, I can go to, you know, the, the, the CDOE, I can buy options on it, I can buy physical if I want to, I can take delivery. So, isn't that circulation? Yes, but what, what, I, I, what am I missing here? That's not circulation, that's you can buy it, but you can't spend it as money. Because you just buy it and take it home. Okay. Circulation refers to the marketplace. 
So, so the, for goods and services? Yeah. Right, okay. Rudy. You got a different goal, the physical coin in your hand, which is a positive value, present good, from any promise of gold in the future. And you missed Sandeep's talk, and he's talking about chits, bonds, bills, and so on, which are all promises of gold. Some farther out, some closer in, they're all promises. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So none of these paper substitutes are actually gold, and therefore none of them is money. None of them is a positive value. They're all debt. They're all promises. And will they or will they not be kept is the question. But the gold itself is not a promise. It's the actual physical good. And when we're talking about a gold standard, that means everything is based on this physical good. Not necessarily, uh, if you started off your, your discussion about transporting, well, under the gold standard, the classical gold standard, gold hardly ever moved. Hmm. It was just sitting there in case of an imbalance of trade. But that never happened because all countries knew that if they had a big imbalance of trade, the gold would start to move. So it didn't even have to move. So the arguments have to look at, we have to look at, and you talk about there will never be a gold standard as if you're convinced of this. And on the other hand, you're saying, I really don't know. So you really well, don't I don't think I said there won't be a gold standard. I, I was, uh, it was more a uh, question, actually. Well, it's something to you that, oh, no, it can't happen. You don't know what can happen. People are looking to resolve the issue. And what, the only place they can look is what worked in the past. We have to do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. And the gold standard, as, as it was practiced during the 1800s, worked pretty well, not perfectly. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that Wednesday, so we can do But again, all this discussion goes back to the most fundamental question, you know, is gold money? Do you believe gold is money? And why is gold money? And, you know, <laughs> how, how did this came to be? And I think this is one of the best essays, deep thinking about how did that institution, social institution, invention by humans called money came to be. And when it did come to exist, what was it that worked the best? And always worked the best ever since. And even to this day, until we completely went uh, off it. We're living an experiment, which is fine. We, humans have lived uh, many experiments in the past, but it's the sort of experiment that has always failed. If you study monetary history of 800 years, there has never been a fiat currency that survived. Not one. It's not like there were exceptions, or they were poorly managed, those, some were better. Not one. And not one currency under the gold standard did fail until they went off the gold standard. That's a pretty good track record. But, but this isn't the fact that they went off the gold standard. Um, the answer to your question? They went off because it failed? No, no. Um, it was still gold. Tomorrow there's going to be a session and the day after about gold standard and gold standard, you know. Um, gold standard and all the imposters. I mean, gold standard is not... Uh, 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 I, won't, I won't go into it. <laughs> uh, what they are promoting now, what, they are, what is acceptable to discuss in polite company now uh, about the gold standard is a form of gold standard that well, is uh, is not really a gold standard because gold wouldn't circulate um, freely. Um, it, it's not the people who would um, decide what the value of gold is. The gold standard, people went off, countries went off because they couldn't afford to fight for more. Well, isn't that a good reason to stay on a gold standard to avoid <coughs> world wars? Well, you wouldn't because who would want to be taxed for it? But the thing is, they did that because they knew they couldn't finance the war unless they went off it, even that they'll be a temporary. And yeah, and, and, and you touch on uh, the gold standard around World War One. I. I mean, what they put in place after World War One was doomed to fail because they set the value of, not the value of, of, of gold, but the value of the circulating money relative to gold at the wrong, you know, too high. 
um, for what the money was worth, for what the pound was worth. It was bound to create deflation. It was bound to create deflation. So, I mean, gold standard is not perfect. I don't think anyone here would argue that it is perfect. It's a, uh, um, but, and I'm not here to talk about the gold standard per se, but more, this session is about hopefully making it clear why gold as a commodity, as a material from the earth, is the most um, appropriate and has been um, commodity to be used as money or numeraire, okay? What do we mean by money? Um, it can be used as a numeraire as opposed to just money. We can have alternative forms of circulating money, but whose value would be measured in gold. So we're talking here about me standard of measure, standard of measure of value. That's the role of gold. It's a standard measure of value. We got afternoon tea served, so we can we can break now and resume at three thirty.